All right, so we are recording our class. And let's talk about um, what we have on this first slide here as our introduction to class for today. Um, so today is Monday. Um, you have um, a few sections of homework that you need um, to do um, by tonight. Um, a couple of them are on um, kinetics problems, um, things that you're gonna be seeing on your test on, uh, some of it anyway, on Wednesday. Um, and then you have a couple of sections in the kinetics that you will not be seeing, and we'll talk about that. And then you have a couple of sections on equilibrium, chapter 13 that you need to um, have homework for, although it's not all of chapter 13 yet because we're gonna be finishing up that information for today. Um, you have a lab on equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle, which kind of aligns with the warm up question um, for today. And then as a reminder, we have a test on Wednesday. It'll be on um, thermodynamics, which was chapter uh, 12. And then um, kinetics, which was chapter 17, with the exception of reaction mechanisms. So things on um, intermediates and catalysts and reaction mechanisms and rate determining steps, that will not be um, on your test on Wednesday. That'll be the following Wednesday. You'll see some things on that. Um, but it will have, you know, looking at data and deciding the um, order of reactants in a reaction and figuring out react um, uh, rate constants and rate expressions and um, integrated rate law type problems um, from the kinetics chapter. So let's take a look at your um, warm up. And we'll look at the first reaction um, here first. So we've got um, carbon dioxide producing carbon monoxide and oxygen gas. The arrow in two directions tells us that it's a reversible reaction. And um, we're going to have this system at equilibrium. Okay, it tells us that the delta H is positive 566 kilojoules um, per mole of reaction. And uh, we want to describe um, the temperature and pressure change that would maximize the amount of carbon monoxide. So let's look at the temperature first. And in order for us to decide whether we wanna increase the temperature or decrease the temperature to shift this reaction towards the product side and increase carbon monoxide production, we need to decide whether or not the reaction's endothermic or exothermic. So in the chat, plug in, is this reaction, the first reaction we're looking at, endothermic or exothermic based on this positive 566? Let's get a couple of people in there, see what we get. Agreed, it's endothermic. So since it's endothermic, if we wanted to incorporate this number into this equation, would we put it on the reactant side or would we put it on the product side? Good, we put it on the reactant side, agreed, okay? And we would treat it as if it were a reactant. So if we wanna increase product, that means we wanna cause a shift in this reaction towards the right. If we have the energy as a reactant over here, are we gonna to wanna to increase the temperature or decrease the temperature to maximize carbon monoxide? Agreed. If we increase the temperature, that's gonna shift the equilibrium towards the right which would increase carbon monoxide production. Good. So now we wanna talk about pressure, okay? We want to um, increase the production of carbon monoxide and we want to change the pressure in order to maximize that production. And what we need to do in order to figure that out is we need to figure out how many moles of gas there are on the reactant side and how many moles of gas there are on the product side. So if we were to look on the reactant side, we have two moles of gas. If we were to look on the product side, we have three moles of gas. So we wanna to shift to the side 
with the larger moles of gas? Are we gonna increase the pressure or decrease the pressure to cause that shift to the right? Agreed, we're gonna decrease the pressure. If we decrease the pressure of this system at equilibrium, it's gonna to wanna to shift to increase that pressure. And shifting to the side with a larger number of moles of gas will do that. So if we increase the temperature and we increase the pressure, that's gonna cause a shift towards the right, which would increase carbon monoxide um, production. Okay, questions on that first one. So let's look at the so second one. We'll, yes. All right. uh, yeah. So if decreasing the pressure will shift it towards the side with uh, more moles of gas will is do the opposite uh, by increasing the pressure that will go to the side with less moles of gas. Agreed. Yep. Because okay. if we if we increase the moles of gas in a container, that's going to increase the pressure. Okay. So if if the question was asking what changes will uh, to maximize the production of CO we would say to increase the pressure to move the uh, moles away from CO? If we want to increase the amount of carbon monoxide, we would decrease the pressure, which, which would shift the equilibrium to the side with more moles of gas. Mm -hmm. Does that but make sense? If, yeah, but if, if we wanted to uh, not maximize the production. Right, uh, if, well, let's say we wanted to maximize the carbon dioxide. Uh -huh. Okay, if we wanted to maximize the carbon dioxide, then we decrease, sorry, we'd increase the pressure because then the system is going to shift towards the side with less moles of gas, which okay. would then bring that pressure back down. Got it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So a question asked, how can we tell um, if it's exothermic? So the first reaction was endothermic. And the reason that we know that is because the delta H value is a positive value. The second reaction that we're going to look at now is exothermic. And the reason why it's exothermic is because delta H, although it doesn't give us an actual number, saying delta H is less than zero is telling us it's negative. So the second reaction is exothermic. So if we wanted to incorporate a value for energy into this reaction, would we put it on the reactant side or would we put it on the product side? Put it into the chat. If we decided this is an exothermic process, would we put the energy here on the reactant side or would we put it here on the product side? Yeah, we put it on the product side, okay? And again, the reason that it's um, exothermic is because the delta H value is a negative value. Okay, so now, if we want to maximize the production of carbon monoxide and energy is essentially a product, okay, would we have to increase the temperature or decrease the temperature to cause a shift to the product side, a shift to the right? Increase temperature or decrease temperature? Okay, so think about this. If energy is over on the product side, if we decrease the temperature, that's going to cause a shift to the side that will relieve that stress or towards the product side, which would increase our carbon monoxide. So we would want to decrease the temperature to cause a shift to the right and an increase in carbon monoxide. Okay. So now let's talk about what pressure would affect the nitrogen monoxide. So if we want to increase the nitrogen monoxide, we need to think about how many moles of gas do we have on the reactant side and how many moles of gas do we have on the product side? So on the reactant side, how many moles of gas do we have? Six, we've got one 
plus five, we've got six, good. How many moles of gas do we have on the product side? 10, yeah, four plus six. So we want to maximize nitrogen monoxide, which means we want to cause a shift to the product side. We have more moles of gas on the product side than we have on the reactant side. So to cause a shift to the side with more moles of gas, would we increase or decrease the pressure? Decrease the pressure, right. So if we were to decrease the pressure, the system's gonna wanna increase that pressure. It's gonna wanna relieve the stress that we've um, applied to that system. And it's gonna do that by shifting to the side with more moles of gas, which would increase the pressure again. So a lower temperature and a higher pressure, no, sorry, lower pressure would cause a shift towards the right. Okay, what kinds of questions do we have on that? There wasn't any math. It's a Le Chatelier's principle type of a problem. If we have a system at equilibrium and we change concentrations or we change temperatures or we change pressures, it's gonna throw that system out of equilibrium and the system is spontaneously going to move back to a state of equilibrium. Why uh, exactly in the, between the uh, two situations would uh, increasing the temperature in the first one uh, shift to the right, but decreasing the pressure, I mean the temperature in the second situation also shift to the right and increase the uh, production? Did I say the wrong thing? We wanna decrease the temperature. Sorry, did I say increase? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant to, I, I, I may have said that wrong. Why uh, increasing the temperature in the first situation shifts to the right, but okay. decreasing the pressure uh, temperature in the second one also shifts to the right? They don't. They they're opposites. So so for the first one, since this is endothermic, energy is on this side. If we increase the temperature, that's going to cause a shift towards the right. Okay. For the second one, because it's exothermic, energy is over here decreasing temperature will cause a shift to the right. Okay, I yeah, I think that makes sense. You okay? Yeah. Okay, so it, it's not always gonna be the same thing. It depends on whether it's endothermic or exothermic. So if it's endothermic, okay, it's a reactant. If we increase the temperature, that's gonna cause a shift to the right. If we decrease the temperature, that would cause a shift to the left. If it's exothermic, energy is on the product side. So if we increase temperature, that would cause a shift to the left. If we decrease temperature, that would cause a shift to the right. Okay. Now, out of the three, concentration, pressure or temperature, only one of them actually affects or changes our equilibrium constant, the value for K. Is it concentration, is it temperature, or is it pressure that can change K? Temperature, okay? Um, if we change temperature, it's going to cause a system either towards the reactant or the product side, which is going to change the ratio of reactants to products, which is what K is. If we change the concentrations, all the concentrations are going to change. If we change pressures, all of the values are going to change. But if we change the temperature, that will change K. Temperature is the only thing that affects K. Other than that, K is a constant. All right, so let's do um, a couple of practice problems like the kinds of things we're gonna see on our test. Um, actually, I don't, hold on one second. I think I hid this by accident. Let's unhide this and we're, I wanna do this first. So let's look at the test first and then we'll look at some um, practice problems. So the test is on Wednesday, okay? I'm gonna have it set up the same exact way that it was set up um, last Wednesday, so it'll open at 11, it'll close at eight. Um, 
Again, if you have an issue with not being able to do it during that time frame, just let me know and we will work something out to make sure that um, you know you can get that test done. Um, you just need to let me know so that you know I can make make different arrangements. Um, keep in mind that um, all of the parts are timed. So you need to make sure that you're not starting at like 10 minutes to eight because the test will shut off at eight o'clock. Um, a good deal would be to probably start by six, 6.30 at the latest so that you have plenty of time to finish up, um, finish up the test before it closes out. Um, there are three parts. The format is exactly the same as it was last week. So part one is kind of the short answer drop down menu, multiple choice kind of questions. There are 12 questions and you have 30 minutes to answer those questions. Um, part two is the um, problems part that you have to work out on a separate sheet of paper. There are seven questions. When you answer those questions, you will put the answer into um, Canvas, um, but I will go back in and give you partial credit after the fact. Um, through your submitted work. There are seven questions and you have um, 45 minutes to complete those seven questions. And then once you're done with part two, then you open up part three and that's where you're gonna submit your work. Okay, same format as what you saw um, on the first test and it'll be the same format that it is on all your tests and your final exam. So what kinds of things should you focus on? Okay, it's on um, thermodynamics, so enthalpy, entropy, and um, uh, free energy. Um, you should know things like, um, what do the signs on delta H, delta S, and delta G mean? So for delta H, um, positive means it's endothermic, negative means it's exothermic. For entropy, Positive means you're increasing the disorder for the system. Negative means you're um, decreasing the disorder in the system. Um, and for delta G, if your delta G value is negative, the process is spontaneous. If delta G is positive, it's non-spontaneous. Now, we had some equations that we dealt with. Um, we can calculate the entropy change for the surroundings by taking uh, the enthalpy change and dividing it by time, well, the negative enthalpy change, divided by time, or sorry, temperature. Um, we can calculate the enthalpy for a reaction by taking the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. We can calculate the entropy change for a reaction by taking the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants. We can find out the free energy change for reaction either by taking the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants or by taking delta H minus T delta S. And whether we use this equation here or this equation here is dependent on what information we're given in the question. If the question gives us the free energy for the products and the reactants, then we would be using this first equation for delta G. But if it gives us the information to calculate the enthalpy and the entropy, then we would use the second equation for delta G. Okay, for entropies, we should um, not only be able to calculate the value, but if we're given some kind of a physical or chemical change, maybe we could um, order um, by increasing entropies or by decreasing entropies. Um, or we could talk about if we're given a chemical reaction, um, is the entropy increasing or decreasing for a particular process? For rates, um, again, the mechanism part of um, the kinetics chapter is not on this test, but being able to use stoichiometry and rates, like if you were given the rate of consumption of a reactant, you could figure out the rate of production of a product based on the stoichiometry and the balanced equation. Or if you're given um, a set of data 
for a reaction where the concentrations of the reactants are varying and you're given the rates, you can figure out the order for the reactants and then figure out what the rate law is. And if you figure out a rate law from a set of data, you can use data to calculate what K is, which is your rate constant, and be able to calculate what the units are um, for that constant. If you're talking about how rate is um, related to um, time, then you'd be looking at the integrated rate law. So zero order, first order, second order, integrated rate law problems. So uh, maybe you're given a graph um, of concentration versus time or the natural log of concentration versus time or the inverse concentration versus time and you have to decide what the order is. Um, and then there are um, the equations that go along with, and I should have put them on here, I'll put them on here tomorrow, um, for the integrated rate law. So that was the um, that um, table that we had the other day. And then um, calculating half-lives um, and the calculations that go along with that. And we'll do a practice problem um, figuring out half-lives today. So it's kind of an overview of what you're going to see on Wednesday. Let's look at a couple of problems. So these do not require a calculator, kind of like your warm up in a way, more conceptual. So for the first one, we're told that the reaction is exothermic. So we should know what that tells us about the reaction. We're given the overall reaction and the um, states of matter for the reactants and the products, no numbers. But from the information we're given, we should be able to figure out what the sign on delta H is. Is it positive or negative? The sign on delta S, is it positive or negative? And the sign on delta G. And then what does that mean about the, the process? For the second question, we're given a reaction. We're given that delta H is greater than zero. And from that information, you need to decide what conditions would make this process, oh, there should only be one arrow there. I don't know why there are two arrows in both of those. Um, what would make that process spontaneous? And there are, there are choices there. Um, is it always spontaneous, never spontaneous, spontaneous at high temperatures or low temperatures? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to figure that out. And then we will um, go over those. Let's see how you do. And I would definitely try to um, you know, practice this and write it all down so that you know, they have them for reference. All right, so let's look at the first one and we'll just put the answers in the chat. So, and you don't have to write the whole word, just look, put a positive sign or a negative sign so we don't have to write it all out. So we have this reaction, it tells us it's exothermic. So are we gonna expect delta H to be positive or negative? Just put the sign in the chat. Agreed, okay, exothermic, means energy is being released, so our products have less energy than our reactants had. So we would expect delta H to be a negative value. All right, so now let's think about delta S, the entropy change. Would we expect it to be positive or negative? Agreed, I would say positive. We've got... Um, Gases on the reactant side, we've got gases on the product side. So there's no phase changes, but we've got nine moles of gas on the reactant side versus 10 moles of gas on the product side. So our entropy is most likely increasing um, during, sorry, during this process. So if 
delta H is negative and delta S is positive, what will delta G be? Yeah, delta G has to be a negative value, okay? Because if we take delta G equals delta H minus T delta S and delta H is negative and we're subtracting a positive because the temperature is positive and delta S is positive, the only value we can get is negative. So this reaction is a spontaneous reaction, okay? Now, I don't know why there are two arrows here. That's just a typo. So let's look at the second one. And again, I don't, I don't know why there are two arrows here. Um, so delta H is positive. Okay, if delta H is positive, what does that tell us about this reaction? It's endothermic, good. Delta H is a positive value. And that is not um, entropy favored, okay? So the next thing we have to do is look at what's happening to our enthalpy favored. I think I, I think I said entropy, enthalpy favored. So now let's look at the entropy. Is our entropy going up or is our entropy going down? Entropy is going up because we've got three moles of gas going to two moles of gas, agreed. So now if delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and we want the process to be spontaneous, what do we want delta G to be, positive or negative, if we want it to be spontaneous? Now, what is delta G in order to be spontaneous? Delta G has to be negative for the process to be spontaneous. Okay, so delta H is positive. Okay, well, that's not enthalpy favored. Delta S is positive. That is entropy favored. So if we want delta G to be negative, if we want this process to be spontaneous, the entropy part of that Gibbs free energy equation has to be larger than the enthalpy value. So A, B, C, or D, what conditions would make that process spontaneous? Yes, B. If we have a high temperature, T delta S will be larger than delta H. And if T delta S is larger than delta H, delta G will be a negative value. Okay, questions on those? Because there's kind of math, but it's much more conceptual. We feel okay? All right, so let's do a couple of math problems. Okay, so for question uh, number three, okay, we're given a set of data. We can't use the stoichiometry from this equation because we don't know if this maybe has a reaction mechanism and there's a rate determining step which would decide what the rate law is. Okay, so we can't use the stoichiometry here, but we can use data in an equation. Okay, a lot like the lab that you did on Friday. Okay, so you want to find out how does ClO2 affect the rate? Okay, and almost always it's going to be zero order, first order, or second order. And then we need to figure out how the concentration of hydroxide affects the rate. Again, zero order, first order, or second order. And then once we figure out the order for both reactants, we can write a rate law. And then once we write that rate law, we can pick one of the trials, plug in the information from that trial into our rate law and calculate K. Okay, so that's the thought process for question number three. 
And then for question number four, it tells us it's a first order reaction. Now we don't know that just from the information we're given, it has to tell us that. Okay, so it tells us it's first order. It tells us that um, if the reaction is 38% complete at the end of 26 seconds, what's the half-life? So what you have to do is you have to calculate K first. And then once you calculate K, you can use the half-life equation for a first order integrated rate law and calculate what the half-life is. Let's see how you do. All right, so let's stop sharing this. I will switch to my document camera and let's see how we did. All right, Oop, that's number four. Okay, so let's look at number three. So for number three, I took <coughs> trial one and compared it to trial two. So I wrote in the information, the, the rate and the concentrations for trial two, and then the rate and the concentrations for trial one. And what I noticed is that K is a constant. So even though I don't know it, it's the same. So it's gonna cancel out. The concentration of um, the hydroxide is a constant. Even though I don't know what order it is, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be a constant. So 2.30 times 10 to the minus one divided by 5.75 times 10 to the minus two gives me four. So I'm quadrupling my um, rate when I go from 0.1 to 0 0.05. So I'm doubling my concentration. So doubling my qu concentration quadruples the rate. These are nice, easy, round numbers. I know that M is two. So my ClO2 is second order. Now, if I do um, trial two and trial three, I didn't cross it out, but K is a constant. When I look at trial two and trial three, the ClO2 is a constant. Doubling the rate when I double the concentration tells me that hydroxide is first order. Now, I don't have to necessarily put that one there, but I did. So this would be my rate expression or my rate law. Second order with respect to ClO2. First order with respect to hydroxide. Third order overall. So um, we had a question. Hold on. How do we know which to put in the denominator? Okay, it doesn't really matter which one to put in the numerator, which one to put in the denominator when you do this. Um, I put the bigger numbers on the top because then I get a four to two ratio as opposed to one quarter to one half. It just would give you the, the inverse of it. And it's a little bit easier to figure out what the order is if the numbers are multiples instead of fractions. So put the bigger numbers on the top and that'll give you whole numbers. So once we figure out what the rate law is or the rate expression, then we want to calculate K. It's a lowercase K as opposed to that capital K that we're working with in our equilibrium chapter, related but not the same. So we would divide both sides by ClO2 squared and divide both sides by hydroxide. So to calculate K, we would take the rate, divide it by ClO2 squared, and divide it by hydroxide. Okay, it doesn't matter what um, trial we use. Okay, I just used the first trial. So I've got my rate. Remember that you have to square the concentration of the um, ClO2. 
So I'm going to be dividing by 0 0.0500 squared, and I'm going to be dividing by 0 0.100, and that gives me 230. Okay, units, molarity per second or moles per liter per second is my rate. Okay, I'm dividing it by um, molarity squared, and I'm dividing it by molarity. So that means one of my molarities will cancel out, and I'm going to be left with one over molarity squared seconds. Or we could write that as um, liters squared per mole squared second. It means the same thing. Whether you talk about in terms of molarities or you talk about in terms of moles per liter, it's going to be the same. So one of the real common mistakes is you figure out the rate expression, but then you forget when you go to do your calculation to square the number. So the reason you figured this out here is so that you can carry it down and use it down here. Okay, questions on number three. All right, so let's look at number four. Okay, so um, it um, gave us um, that it's 38% complete. And this is kind of a, not a trick on words, but if it's 38% complete, what that essentially means is we started with 100, whatever, it doesn't matter, and 38% of it reacted. That means we've got 62% of it after 26 seconds. So we don't want to put 38 in here. That's how much of it reacted. We want to know how much we have left after 26 seconds. So this is a, a pretty common type of a, an error here to put the 38 in here. So we would take um, the negative um, ln of 62 over 100, divide that by 26, and that's going to give us our K value for that first order reaction. And since it's a first order reaction, to calculate the half-life, it's independent of the concentration. It's just uh, the natural log of 2, which is 0 0.693 divided by K. So since we calculated what K is, we would just divide 0 0.693 by 0 0.018, and that gives us 39 seconds. Okay, so questions on number four. Again, the only way that we know this is the fact that it told us in the question that it was a first order reaction. All right, my friends. So we are going to switch back. And we're going to move on for today. So we're going to do some um, math with our equilibrium um, expressions, which we started talking about um, last Thursday. So we're looking at, oops, I lost my, hold on one second. I want my little spotlight. There we go. Okay. So we're looking at a reversible reaction. The reaction is at equilibrium. We're given equilibrium values for the nitrogen the hydrogen and the ammonia. And we want to calculate K. And we're going to calculate it in terms of concentrations. That C often is just assumed and you don't see it. Um, you would have to put P if you're talking about in terms of pressures. Now, for this particular question, we want concentrations of nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. We're given moles in a five liter container. So we have to calculate the molarity first before we can do anything else. So to calculate molarity, I'm gonna do it for nitrogen and then have you do the hydrogen and the ammonia. So to calculate the concentration or the molarity, we take the moles and divide it by the volume. So 1.50 moles divided by 5.00 liters tells us that the molarity of the nitrogen gas in this equilibrium mixture is 0 0.300 molar, okay? Three significant digits here, three significant digits here. We're rounding to three significant digits here. So we have to put those zeros in there. 
So go ahead on your own, calculate what the concentration of the hydrogen is, <coughs> the molarity, and calculate what the concentration of the ammonia is or the molarity. Okay, I modeled the first one. All right, so for hydrogen, 4.45 divided by 5.00. Make sure you have three significant digits. So 0 0.890 would be hydrogen. Okay, do the same thing for the ammonia. Okay, so 7.05 divided by five. So yeah, 1.41 moles per liter, 1.41 for the molarity. We want to calculate K. So the next step is we have to write a K expression. Make sure that you do that for every step. Actually, I don't want to do it for you. Okay, write your K expression. Let's do that as a review. So remember that K is um, products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. Super important that we always write a K expression when we're looking at an equilibrium question. Remember also that we only include um, ions and gases, liquids and solids don't get included in there, but they're all gases. This is a homogeneous equilibrium for this one. All right, so to write our K expression, we've got our product. So ammonia squared over our reactants. So hydrogen to the first power times nitrogen, sorry, to the first power times hydrogen to the third power. So now that we've written the K expression, we know the equilibrium concentrations. We're going to plug these numbers into our expression and get our value for K. And there are no units for an equilibrium constant. So you don't have to worry about that part. So plug them, actually write the numbers down, then plug them into your equation. Okay, so 1.41 squared divided by 0 0.300, divided by 0 0.890 cubed. Order of operations is important in your calculators. Okay, plug the numbers in and see what you get for your value of K. Okay, so I'm plugging in the numbers and this is what I would expect, you know, to get full credit you, know, you want to show all of your work. It's a process. And in your calculator, you would put four or 1.41 squared, I would say equals, divided by 0 0.300 equals, divided by 0 0.890 cubed. That's really the best way to put that into your calculators. And if you put them in the calculator with the right order of operation, you should get 9.40 for your answer. Three significant digits here. Let's put three significant digits in our K value. All right, so now we're gonna look at how K will change if we change the balanced equation. 
So we have this equation, okay, we've got nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to produce ammonia. We know that K equals our products over our reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. But let's say that we were to take this reaction and uh, multiply it by two. Okay, so this is a one to three to two ratio. So now we've got a two to six to four ratio. We've multiplied all the coefficients by two. Well, when we write the K expression, it still would be the products over the reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. But because we doubled the coefficients, this now becomes a four, this becomes a two, and this becomes a six. Now, how can we kind of shorthand that up? If we have an equation and we know the K value and we take that equation and we multiply it by a coefficient. So in this case, we're multiplying it by two. We can take K and square it and that'll give us the K value for that new reaction. So whatever we do to the coefficients in the balanced equation is what we would put here. And that's how we can figure out what the new K value would be. So if the stoichiometric coefficient and the balanced equation are multiplied by a factor, the new equation is equal to the original equilibrium raised to the power of the factor that we multiplied our equation by. So let's look at something else. Let's say that we have nitrogen and oxygen producing nitrogen monoxide. Okay, well, the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. And then let's say that we have um, a second equation. So we've got NO plus O2 gives us NO2. We can write a K expression for that second reaction. Again, products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. Now, we've talked about Hess's law, where we can add these two reactions together and it gives us the overall reaction. Okay, well, the 2NO is here and here, that cancels out. And we get N2 plus 2O2 yields 2NO2. But to calculate, if we know what K1 is and we know what K2 is, we can calculate what K is for this overall reaction. So if two or more equations can be added to give an overall reaction, the equilibrium constant for the overall reaction equals the product of the equilibrium expressions for the two uh, reactions we're adding together. So in other words, K for this overall reaction would equal K1 times K2. Well, we calculated or we figured out what K1 is here. We figured out what K2 is here. If we were to multiply these two equilibrium um, expressions together, NO squared here and here cancels out. And we're left with our products over our reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation for the overall reaction. So if two or more equations are added to give an overall uh, equation, the product of the K values for the individual equations will equal the overall equation. Just manipulating what K is. All right, so now we're gonna look at um, some more um, problems. So here, okay, it tells us that we take 0 0.200 moles of nitrogen gas and 0 0.600 moles of hydrogen gas in a one liter container. And the pressure is 10.0 atms. 
what is the value of the equilibrium constant? That means we wanna calculate K. If the equilibrium mixture contains 0 0.003220 moles of ammonia. Well, this 0 0.200 and this 0 0.600 are not at equilibrium. They're before the reaction takes place and before equilibrium is established. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make what's called an ice chart. And that's gonna help us to kind of organize our numbers. So in our ice chart, I stands for initial. So in this case, the initial concentration of nitrogen was 0 0.200 moles in a one liter container. So 0 0.200. Hydrogen is 0 0.600 moles in a one liter container, but there wasn't any ammonia initially because the reaction hasn't started. And this is our I in our ice chart. Now, the C is for the change that takes place in order for us to establish equilibrium. And the change is a stoichiometric change. It's based on the balanced equation. So in this case, X amount of nitrogen is going to be reacted. That's why there's a negative sign. 3X of hydrogen is going to be reacted. That's why we have the negative sign and it's a one to three ratio. 2X of ammonia is going to be produced. And we have a plus sign here because we're making the ammonia to get to equilibrium. So the E part of this ice chart is equilibrium. So we've got initial change equilibrium. Ice charts are a way for us to organize our information. So at equilibrium, we're going to have 0 0.200 minus X for our nitrogen. And we have 0 0.600 minus 3X for our hydrogen. And we're going to have 2x for our ammonia. And it tells us that that's 0 0.00320 moles per liter. So it's giving us what 2x equals. Now, there was a question in the chat. It says, how do we know it's not at equilibrium? Because it doesn't mention anything about ammonia initially. In order for us to be at equilibrium, the reactants have to produce products. The products are going to start to reproduce reactants, and we're going to get um, an equilibrium established when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So since we don't have any ammonia to begin with, we haven't established equilibrium yet. Some of the nitrogen is going to be reacted. Some of the hydrogen is going to be reacted. Some ammonia is going to be produced until we get to equilibrium. And the question says that at equilibrium, this is how much ammonia we have, okay? An ice chart is a way for us to organize our information. Now, what can we do with that? Well, if 2x equals 0 0.00320, that means x equals 0 0.00160. And if we know x, we can figure out the equilibrium concentration of nitrogen 0.200 minus X. And the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen, 0 0.600 minus 3X. And once we calculate the equilibrium values for everything, we can write a K expression and calculate K or our equilibrium constant. So at equilibrium, nitrogen will be 0 0.200, that's how much we started with, minus 0 0.00160, which is how much had to react to make our ammonia. So at equilibrium, we have 0.1984 moles per liter of nitrogen. We're going to carry an extra significant digit along. 
for our hydrogen, we would take 0 0.600 and minus three times X, where X is 0 0.00160. So at equilibrium, hydrogen is 0 0.5952 molar. So now we know the equilibrium concentration of nitrogen. We know the equilibrium concentration of hydrogen. We were given the equilibrium concentration of ammonia. We can calculate K. Now, the first thing we have to do is write an equilibrium expression. You're going to get a point off if you don't write that when you do your problems. So products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. And then once you write your K expression, plug in the equilibrium concentrations and calculate K. Okay, make sure you write your K expression. So products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. And then we know the equilibrium values. We're just going to plug those numbers into our K expression, okay, into our equilibrium expression and figure out what K is. And again, you know, the order of operation, how you're plugging it in the calculator is super important. Okay, so make sure you practice doing that so that you don't run into a problem with you can show all your work on paper and you get the wrong answer because you're not plugging it in right. So 0 0.00320 squared equals divided by 0.1984 and then divided by 0 0.5952 cubed equals. I agree. 2.45 times 10 to the minus four. Good. Now, this is a small number. That means that equilibrium is established before we produce very much product. So the reactants are favored when the system reaches equilibrium. So whereas the problems you were looking at before you were just given the equilibrium values and you calculated K. This time you had to figure out what the equilibrium values were. So let's look at another one, same kind of problem. So we have a reaction and it says that we put 0 0.380 moles of HI in a one liter container that means the moles equals the molarity because we're dividing by one. <clears throat> it doesn't mention anything about them adding hydrogen or iodine to the container originally. That means their initial values are zero. And then it says the reaction when it gets to equilibrium has an iodine concentration of 3.80 times 10 to the minus two, we want to calculate K. So we're going to start with an ice chart. We always start with an ice chart. Okay. I stands for initial. C stands for the stoichiometric change. E stands for equilibrium. So originally, we have. 0 0.380 moles per liter of HI, and we don't have any hydrogen and we don't have any iodine. Based on the stoichiometry in the balanced equation, 2X of HI is going to react. The negative sign is because it's reacting. X amount of hydrogen and X amount of iodine are going to be produced. So at equilibrium, we're going to have 0 0.380 minus 2x, x, and x. Now, the question tells us that at equilibrium, iodine 
is 3.80 times 10 to the minus two. So it's giving us X. So if we know X here, it's the same as here. And we can figure out the equilibrium concentration of the hydrogen iodide by taking 0 0.380 and subtracting two times X. Once we calculate the equilibrium values, we'd write a K expression, plug in the equilibrium values and calculate what K is. So let's see how you do with that. So it tells us that hydrogen or that iodine is 3.80 times 10 to the minus two. Since it's a one-to-one -one ratio, oops, sorry, I did the other way. The um, hydrogen iodide is gonna be 0 0.380 minus two X. This two X came from the stoichiometry and the balanced equation. So 0 0.380 minus two times 3.80 times 10 to the minus two. That means at equilibrium, HI is 0 0.304. And hydrogen is the same as iodine. So now that we have the equilibrium values, write a K expression, plug in the numbers, watch your order of operation and solve for K. Okay, so your K expression is hydrogen times iodine divided by hydrogen iodide squared. We plug in our values. So 3.80 times 10 to the minus two times 3.80 times 10 to the minus two divided by 0 0.304 squared. And that gives us a K value of 1.56 times 10 to the minus two. Again, a small K value, which means our reactants are favored and we didn't produce much product before equilibrium was established. Questions on the general concept behind ice charts. All right, so let's take um, a quick, let's say three or four minute break. Let's go by 7.15. We'll come back and we're going to continue with this and hopefully wrap up um, chapter 13. So take a couple minutes drink, go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do, and then we'll come back in, in 7.15. <clears throat> all right, so let's look at um, another question. And these are all, once we kind of get a, a feel for how these equilibrium problems go, um, they're all very similar types of problems. So for this one, we're given a reaction, okay? It's a reversible reaction, it's at equilibrium. <clears throat> So it says, suppose you start with 0 0.0200 moles of um, carbon monoxide and water in a one liter container, calculate the molarity of each substance at equilibrium, um, and it gives us K. So this time we're not calculating K. Really the questions are, are either we're given the concentrations or we can figure them out and we wanna calculate K or we're given K and we wanna calculate concentrations. But we're gonna always do the problems in a very similar way. So we're gonna write an ICE chart, okay? Again, ICE, you know, I stands for initial, C stands for change, E stands for equilibrium, okay? So it tells us we've got 0 0.0200 moles per liter, 0 0.0200 moles per liter, 
and no carbon dioxide and no hydrogen uh, to begin with. Now in the previous problems, it gave us one of the equilibrium values so we could figure out all the other ones. It doesn't do it here. But we can figure out the change, it's the stoichiometry. We know that some of um, our reactants are gonna react. We don't know how much, but we know they're gonna be the same because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. We know we're gonna be producing a product we don't know how much, but we know based on the stoichiometry, it's gonna be the same amount. So that means at equilibrium, we're gonna have 0 0.0200 minus X, 0 0.0200 minus X, X and X. All right. <clears throat> so we write our K expression. Ice charts and K expressions are like the key to equilibrium problems. Now, this time we know K. So we'll plug in 0 0.580 for K. We don't know what carbon monoxide and hydrogen are, but we know that they're both gonna be equal to each other. So we're just gonna say they're X times X. We don't know carbon monoxide or water, but we know they are both the same and they're 0 0.0200 minus X. So really we could simplify this and say X squared over 0 0.0200 minus X. Now, both the numerator and the denominator are squared on the right-hand side here. And our goal is to solve for X so we can figure out the equilibrium concentrations for everything in the reaction. So if we wanna solve for X, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of the squares. And to do that, we take the square root of both sides. So the square root of 0.580 is 0 0.760. The square root of x squared is x. And the square root of 0 0.0200 minus x squared is 0 0.0200 minus x. So now we have a little bit of algebra to do. We want to solve for x. So we're going to take. 0 0.0200 minus X and get it out of the denominator. We're going to multiply both sides by 0 0.0200 minus X. That gives us X equals 0 0.0760 times 0 0.0200 minus X. Well, the next thing we're going to want to do is get rid of the parentheses. So we're going to distribute that 0 0.076 or 0 0.760. And we get X equals 0 0.0152 minus 0 0.760X. Now we've got X on the left-hand side of the equation and we have X on the right-hand side of the equation. So now we want to get X on the same side. We're going to add 0 0.760X to both sides of the equation. And then to solve for X, we're going to divide both sides by 1.760. And that would give us X. Now, we haven't answered the question yet. We've solved for X. And in math, you solve for X and you've kind of answered the question. But what this wants to know is what are the equilibrium concentrations? So we want to actually identify that. So to calculate the equilibrium concentrations, well, the carbon dioxide is X and the hydrogen is X. And the carbon monoxide and the water are both 0 0.0200 minus X. So carbon monoxide is 0 0.0200 minus X. Hydrogen 
is actually the same thing. Carbon dioxide is X and hydrogen is also X. So in this kind of question, we were given the initial values, we were given K, and we wanted to calculate the equilibrium concentrations. And again, the key to any equilibrium problem, write an ice chart, it helps you to organize the data. Write a K expression, and really the problems go one of two ways. Either you know the concentrations and you're calculating K, or you know K and you're calculating concentrations. So let's look at another one. Okay, it gives us the equilibrium constant. Okay, so K equals 10.5. We've got our reaction at equilibrium. It says calculate the equilibrium concentrations of reactants and products when 0.252 moles of reactant, CH2Cl2, is introduced into a container. Well, it doesn't mention the CH4 and it doesn't mention the CCL4, they're zero initially. If it doesn't mention it, it's not in the container to begin with. So we're gonna start with our ice chart. Okay, we start with 0 0.252, zero, and zero. The change is stoichiometric, so negative 2x will react. x and x are produced. So at equilibrium, we have 0 0.252 minus 2x, x, and x. So from there, we want to write a K expression. Okay, write your K expression and then match it up with what I put up there. Products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. Okay, so the concentration of CH4 times the concentration of CCL4 divided by the concentration of CH2Cl2 squared. Now you want to fill in what you know. So we know K and we are going to plug in these values for equilibrium. So plug in to our equilibrium expression what you know. So we have 10.5, this was given to us. We don't know CH4, but it's X based on the stoichiometry and the balanced equation. We don't know CCl4, carbon tetrachloride, but it's X. And we don't know CH2Cl2, but it's gonna be the initial amount minus the amount that reacts. And we have to remember that because we squared it in the expression, we're squaring it here. Now, the math becomes the same as the math we did before. We've got x squared over 0.252 minus 2x squared. Follow what we did in the last question. Take the square root of both sides, isolate x, Solve for X, and then once you solve for X, plug them back in here and calculate your equilibrium values. And whenever the numerator and the denominator are squared, this is the way we want to solve the problem. 
Take the square root of both sides. And remember, just because you solve for X doesn't mean you answered the question. Once you figure out what X is, you need to go back into your ice chart and figure out what the equilibrium values are for your reactants and your products. Okay, so we're going to multiply both sides by 0.252 minus 2x. Then we're going to isolate x, and we should get 0 0.109 for x. So that means that CH2Cl2 is going to be 0.2. 252 minus 2x, which gives us 3.37 times 10 to the minus 2. And then the methane and the carbon tetrachloride are equal to each other, and they're both equal to x. So point, and there should be a molar there, there should be a unit, 0 0.109 molar, it should say. Okay, so what do we think? How do we do on those? Again, the, the key, write an ice chart for an equilibrium problem, write a K expression, and then either you're given the concentration and you're trying to find, or you're given concentrations and you're trying to find out K, or you're given K and you're trying to find out concentrations. All right, so now we have another one. So the initial concentration of PCl3 and Cl2 are 0 0.0371. If the initial concentration of PCl5 is zero and K is 0 0.021, we want to calculate the concentration of PCL3 at equilibrium. All right, so we'll do this step by step. So the first thing I want you to do is write an ice chart. Okay, initial stoichiometric change and equilibrium. Okay, don't go any further than that yet. Write your ice chart, plug in your numbers. <clears throat> now, this one's starting with the PCL3 and the CL2, that doesn't matter, okay? So we've got 0 0.0371. 0 0.0371 and zero. Those are the initial values. The change, well, it's a one to one to one ratio, but look at the way the change is set up. We can't have any PCL5 reacting because we don't start out with any of it. But the PCL3 and the CL2 are going to react. We don't know how much, but we know they're going to react in the same amount because it's a one to one ratio. So minus x, minus x, and plus x. So at equilibrium, zero plus x. So we've got x amount of PCL5 at equilibrium and 0 0.0371 minus x for both the phosphorus trichloride and the chlorine. All right, so we wrote our ice chart. Now, write a K expression. 
products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. Oops. Okay, so once you write your K expression, substitute in these equilibrium values out of your ice chart. Okay, so PCL3 times CL2 over PCL5 equals K. Now, you could write 0 0.0371 minus X times 0 0.0371 minus X, but because these values are equal to each other, <coughs> I'm just gonna write them once and write squared. Okay, so 0 0.0371 minus X squared over X. <coughs> All right. Y for the uh, equation uh, is uh, PCL5 uh, positive and then the PSCL3 and CL2 are negative, but in the KC equation, the, uh, the, they're on the top. It's, oh, well, because it's still always going to be products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. So the value that we were given for K is for the forward reaction. So that wouldn't mean, so even though PCL5 is a reactant, it wouldn't be a negative X value? It can't be negative because it starts at zero. Oh, okay. Right? So, so you have to kind of take a look at the numbers that you're given. Um, the, this reaction can't go in the forward direction initially because there isn't any reactant. So it goes in the reverse direction initially. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, the K value that we're given is always going to be for the way the reaction is written, not necessarily the way the um, reaction takes place in the, in the container. Okay, so we know K. So we're going to plug in 0 0.021 for K. We have 0 0.0371 minus X squared over X. Right, well, we've got to do algebra to get X by itself. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get X out of the denominator. And to do that, we're going to multiply both sides by X. Okay, now after we do that, we're going to um, need to write this in terms of a quadratic. Ooh, it's a little bit of algebra, sorry. So we would FOIL this 0 0.0371 minus X. So it would be 0 0.0371 minus X times 0 0.0371 minus X, which gives us 0 0.00, 1376 minus 0 0.0742x plus x squared. All we did is square the numerator. So we're squaring the numerator and multiplying both sides by x to get x out of the denominator. And then we need to get this into the quadratic form. And to do that, we're going to have to subtract. 0 0.021 my, or 0 0.021x from both sides. So now we've manipulated this equation so that it's in the quadratic form. Okay, now quick review of some algebra. When we're in the quadratic form, the coefficient in front of x squared, that's a, the coefficient in front of X is B. And the last number there is C. And what we would do then is we would plug this into our quadratic formula. So let's review what that is. Okay, so when we go to use our quadratic formula, X will equal negative B 
plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Now, b in this particular quadratic is negative 0 0.0952. So that's what we would sub in for b. It's what we would sub in for b here, and we'd have to square it. A is one, it's assumed, we don't write it. And C is 0 0.001376. And we'd have to do all of that under our radical and then take the square root of it. And we divide it by two times A where A equals one. So we'd plug in all of those numbers, we'd get, 0 0.0952 plus or minus the square root of 0 0.0952 squared minus four times one times 0 0.001376. And we take that whole quantity and divide it by two. Now we end up with two answers for X. And we should remember that if we were to graph the quadratic, it's going to cross the x-axis in two places. Um, if we solve for it using our quadratic formula, we're going to get two x values. But the initial concentration of phosphorus trichloride and chlorine are 0 0.0371. And we're going to be subtracting x for it. But x can't be greater than the initial concentration. So this X is invalid. This can't be an option for our answer, which means X must be 0 0.0178. So only one of the X's is ever gonna be a legitimate answer from your quadratic. So once we solve for X, we can figure out the equilibrium concentrations, which is what we're looking for. And in this case, it actually didn't ask us for all the equilibrium concentrations. It just asked us for the equilibrium concentration for the phosphorus trichloride. So to figure that out, we would take 0 0.0371 and subtract X. So the phosphorus trichloride would be 0 0.0371 minus 0 0.0178. So the concentration, there probably should be a molarity here. The concentration of the phosphorus trichloride at equilibrium is 0 0.0019 moles per liter. A different variation on an equilibrium problem, but the starting point is still the same as all the other problems we did. Because we've got, we write down our reaction, we've got our ice chart, we have our K expression, and then we plug in the information we know, and then we go about our business to solve for X. Okay, a little bit harder math-wise maybe because you have to use a quadratic, which you will not be using very often at all in this course, but it does come up. So we did want to, to go through a problem like that. All right, so let's look at um, this question. So <clears throat> we have, um, HCH3COO plus water gives us H3O plus, this is called hydronium, plus CH3COO, which is acetate. So we're really, we're taking what's called acetic acid and we're reacting it with water and we're producing hydronium and acetate. And we're going to be doing a lot of these kinds of equilibrium problems in the next couple of chapters. Now, it gives us um, the concentration of the acid to begin, to begin with, the CH3COOH, doesn't matter whether this H is written here or it's written at the beginning of the formula, it doesn't matter. Um, and it gives us KC and it wants us to calculate the equilibrium values. So we're going to start by writing our ice chart. So see if you can fill in the ice chart for this question. It only gives you the initial concentration 
of this HCH3COO, it's the same thing as, as this year. Okay, it tells you that's how much you have per liter. Nothing else is in the container initially. We don't know what the equilibrium values are, so they're stoichiometric based on the balanced equation. Just do the ice chart. We're going to do this one step at a time together. Now, this one's a little tricky. Remember we talked about how liquids and solids are not part of an equilibrium expression. So we're not gonna put it in the ice chart. Okay, we can't talk about liquids in terms of molarity. So initially we've got 0 0.100 moles per liter of that HCH3COO or acetic acid. And we have no, this is called hydronium, and we have no acetate, okay? It's a pretty small K value. So not very much of this reactant is gonna produce product before equilibrium is established. We don't know how much is gonna react. So we're gonna say X amount of it reacts. And we're gonna produce X amount of our products. Now, the reason why the reaction is gonna go in this direction is because we don't have any product. It can't go in this direction initially. It has to go in this direction. So negative X plus X plus X. So at equilibrium, we have 0 0.100 minus X, X and X. All right, we have our ice chart. Write a K expression. Remember that if this is a heterogeneous equilibrium, liquids aren't included. Okay, write a K expression. Okay, products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balance equation. These are all ones. All right, so what do we know? Well, we know K. So we're going to plug in 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 for K. This is X. This is X. And this is 0 0.100 minus X. All right, well, if we look, that's gonna end up being a quadratic again. But here's the trick I'm gonna give you, and it is gonna work every single time. I'm gonna make the math super easy for you. If K is very small, and 10 to the minus five is very small, it's 0.000018. That means that not very much of this reactant actually reacts to produce product. It means that this X is essentially insignificant relative to the initial concentration. Such a small amount of this reactant actually reacts when we establish equilibrium that we can actually get rid of this X out of the equation. Okay, it's so reactant favored that we can do that. Okay, now, as long as X is super small, we're gonna make the math significantly easier. We're gonna say this X doesn't matter. And since this X with significant digits, isn't gonna change our answer, we can rewrite this as point or 1.80 times 10 to the minus five equals X squared over 0 0.100. Now it's not a quadratic anymore. Math is significantly easier. And with two significant digits or three significant digits in this problem, it's not gonna make a difference in our answer. So let's make the math easier. So if we want to solve for X, we're going to have to multiply both sides by 0 0.100. That'll give us X squared. And then take the square root, and that'll give us X. We've eliminated the need to do a quadratic. Okay, so multiply both sides by 0 0.100. That'll give us X squared. Take the square root of both sides. That'll give us X. 
So X equals 0 0.0013. Now think about that. This value here was 0 0.100. If we subtract 0 0.0013, it's really not going to change this number at all significantly. So we can eliminate it from our problem. That means the concentration of H3O plus hydronium and the concentration of CH3COO acetate are both 0 0.0013. And the acetate's 0 0.100 minus 0 0.0013, but that's so close to 0 0.100 that it's okay for us to do that. If we had gone through the quadratic uh, equation, we would have gotten the same answer with a couple of significant digits. So we've just made the math easier. All right, here we go. Last thing we're going to go through for today is we're going to kind of look at that delta G value from our thermochemistry chapter. And when we talk about free energy, um, we were looking at it under standard conditions. Well, now we're going to switch that a little bit. The free energy change for a process taking place when the reactants and the products are not at standard conditions meaning they're either not one ATM or they're not one molar. We can relate that by looking at this equation here. So this little not sign here tells us that the values are at standard conditions. Okay, one ATM, one molar concentrations. This value here means we're not at standard conditions. And if we look, we have a Q here, which is not equilibrium values. So we're going to relate K and Q and delta G. So we want to calculate the delta G value, the free energy change at 875 degrees Celsius in a five liter container containing 0 0.100 moles of all three of these gases. Now, it tells us that at standard conditions, that value would be 33 kilojoules per mole. But that would be when these concentrations are one molar. They're not one molar. So we're going to have to figure out the concentrations, figure out Q, and then calculate our new delta G value. So let's look at Q first. Okay, well, actually, we'll do the whole thing, I guess. So um, the delta G at standard conditions is what we were given. Okay, now we were given it in terms of kilojoules per mole, but the R value we're gonna use is in terms of joules per mole Kelvin. So we're just gonna do a conversion from kilojoules per mole to joules per mole. And we're gonna do that by just multiplying by a thousand. So here's our free energy at standard conditions. We were given that number. We're going to add to that R, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. This is a constant. Times our temperature, which has to be in Kelvin. So we're going to add 273 to 875. And then we're going to take the LN of Q. Now Q is products over reactants raised to the power of the coefficient in the balanced equation. So hydrogen cubed times nitrogen to the first over ammonia 
squared. Now the concentrations are moles per liter. So rather than doing them in a separate step, I'm just doing it all at once. So we calculate the molarity of the hydrogen, moles per liter and cubit. Find the molarity of the nitrogen, moles per liter. <clears throat> Divide that by the molarity of the ammonia, moles per liter squared. That would give us Q, non-equilibrium values. We take the ln of that number, multiply it by the temperature in Kelvin, <clears throat> multiply it by 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, take all of that and add it to 33 times 10 to the third joules per mole Kelvin. And what that gives us is the free energy change associated with this reaction at these non-standard conditions. And the value is negative, which means at these conditions, this reaction would be spontaneous. But at standard conditions, the value is positive and it would not be spontaneous. Now, relating free energy and equilibrium. Okay, well, if we're at equilibrium, the free energy of the products equals the free energy of the reactants. Everything's at its lowest possible energy. So delta G equals zero at equilibrium. So if we look at our equation and we're at equilibrium, delta G here will equal zero. And if we're at equilibrium, Q will equal K. So we're going to get a slightly different equation here. This equals zero. So we're going to subtract RTLN of K from both sides to calculate what our free energy change would be at standard conditions. So delta G naught would equal negative RTLN of K because we're at equilibrium. So if we're at equilibrium, delta G equals zero, Q equals K, and now we have a new equation. And we could manipulate that equation if we wanted to calculate uh, the equilibrium constant instead of the free energy change, we would just take E, to the negative delta G over RT. So in other words, we divide by negative RT on both sides. That would give us the natural log of K. And then we take E uh, to the negative on both sides of the equation. And that gives us this equation here. So if we wanna calculate delta G, free energy from K, we would use this equation. If we wanted to calculate K from our free energy, we would use this equation. Now, what does that all mean? Well, if K is greater than one, products are larger than reactants. And it means that the forward reaction is spontaneous, so delta G would be negative. If K is less than one, it means the products are favored. So we don't have much, or sorry, the reactants are favored. We don't have much product, which means the forward reaction rate is non-spontaneous or delta G would be a positive value. And if K were to equal one, Delta G would equal zero, and reactants and products are comparatively abundant. Okay, so that's as far as we're going to go for today. That essentially finishes up chapter 13.
Okay, you have some homework you need to do for tonight. Tomorrow when we come in, we'll do a practice problem like some of the stuff that we did today. We'll do a couple more practice problems to get you ready for your test on Wednesday. And then we're gonna start the next chapter, chapter 14, which is gonna start in with acids and bases and eventually get us back to equilibrium. And then your test will be on Wednesday. And again, it will be on thermodynamics, delta H, delta S, delta G. And it will be on kinetics, uh, rate laws and integrated rate laws, but it will not inc include um, uh, reaction mechanisms or intermediates and catalysts. That will not be on the test this coming Wednesday. You haven't done the homework on that anyway yet. So we are going to stop sharing. Um, somewhere in here. Okay, I will stop.